Jerry Griffith was caught in the to catch a predator sting of Riverside, California. He was 45 years of age at the time and believed that he was talking to a 13 year old female. Over the course of this video, I'll take a look at the chat log between him and the perverted justice decoy and pull apart his interview with Chris Hansen. Before I get started on the chat log though, there is one key point I'd like to discuss. Once Jerry reaches the sting house and is confronted by Chris, he adopts the defense that he believed he was talking to a 22 year old aunt of the decoy called Adriana. As we read over the chat log, keep this detail in mind, as you will discover there is no mention of Adriana anywhere. Let's begin, shall we? On the first page, Jerry opens with, Hi, are you single? Do you like older guys? I'm 35, which is absolutely a lie, as we are all aware that he is in fact 45. The decoy tells him that she is 13, and his response is, Oh my god, laugh out loud, sorry, I thought you was older. This is the time where one should close the chat and move along. Instead, Jerry asks an exploratory question. He says, I'm sure you don't want a guy my age, laugh out loud. This is to try figure out if the young child would in fact give him a chance. He has immediately exposed that he would be interested to talk to the minor and is trying to figure out if the sentiment is reciprocated. Predator status thoroughly established in the first few lines. The decoy now asks if Jerry is cute. A provocative question indeed. The perverted justice decoys have been criticized over the years for luring the men into this situation, and this could very well be one of those moments in which they are accused. But I would argue against that. Their job is to act as a teen who is interested in sex, and it is an adult's job, if ever confronted with this situation, to handle themselves maturely. As we move down the page, Jerry is preparing to show the decoy himself via webcam, and he states, Please be honest, but don't be rude. I'm either cute or not. Exposing again the insecure nature of his mind. Possibly people have been rude to him in the past. More to the point though, I think that he's just hyper aware that he is talking to a young teen. And when she sees that he is a fully grown man, he's anticipating her to be rude as teenagers so often can be. He just wants to know whether she's into this situation or not. He doesn't want to hit on his ego. Right at the end of the page here, we see that he wants to turn off his camera as he is shy. It seems to me though that he is trying to play as the awkward shy guy. This could be a reach, but around the early 2000s, the awkward shy guy was really picking up momentum as the pinnacle of male attractiveness. The nerdy guy had begun taking over the role of heartthrob amongst teens, with characters like Seth Cohen from The O.C. getting really popular, and a lot of guys that I knew really played into this role when trying to attract girls. Masculinity for so long was portrayed in a way where men had a real macho flavor about their aura and conduct, and the rise of the nerdy guy came along to balance the scales. Vulnerability became popular, and men started to show that there was much more beneath the surface than muscles and testosterone. I remember sitting around one day and thinking, why are a bunch of my friends saying that they are awkward and shy now? The answer would be the age-old answer for why men do a lot of things they do, to attract a mate. Possibly this could be what we see here with Jerry, or quite possibly the fact that he is showing his face at the age of 45 to a 13 year old whom he wishes to groom was too intense for him, using the guise of being shy as an excuse to shut the camera off. Whichever it may be, it does not bode well for Jerry. As we move on to the next page, we have more predatory lines, but the one that does catch my attention is, I am divorced, looking for a good girl to be with. Let's just say for a moment that he is not talking to someone who has identified as a minor. He did not need to bring up his divorce. This leads me to think that the divorce happened recently and is still prominent in his mind. If this is the case, what about working on yourself, Jerry? If your marriage didn't work out, why don't you spend some time getting to know yourself again, learning what it is that you love, what makes you smile, why the relationship did not work? How is it that you can best spend your time in the face of a non-attached or committed existence? If you can figure these things out and attain a better understanding of yourself, this will not only make you more attractive to interested parties, but also give you a better chance of having a successful relationship if and when another does come around. I don't think trolling the internet and investing emotionally romantic and sexual energy into a minor counts as working on yourself. He further goes on to say, I'm looking for someone that is nice, not mean, and someone that is not a man-hater. I want romance. I don't like haters. Based on this, it sounds like his marriage really didn't end so well. As we'll see later in his interview with Chris, it appears that he handles conflict in a rather childish manner. I'm speculating here, 
But relationships can be difficult and require a lot of understanding and care from both parties involved. It is likely that Jerry navigated his marriage using lies and childish behavior, which would have angered his wife. The conflict that ensued, he interprets as man-hating. When he says that he wants romance, I can't help but to think it is not romance that he is looking for at all. He just wants someone who won't clash with him, someone who won't call him out on the ridiculous nature of his lies. He wants someone who will say nothing but yes, Jerry. He wants a sex doll who has no thoughts or opinions of their own. And I'm guessing that right now in this moment, he believes his best chance of finding this brand of romance is with a minor. He tells the decoy, you seem like a really cool chick. A strange thing to say is the decoy has almost said nothing for the entirety of this conversation. A common pattern that I've seen amongst some people is that they will do all of the talking and then compliment the person that is listening as being an interesting or cool person, yet barely a shred of their personality has had a chance to shine through. So either the person who is doing the talking is projecting a personality that they want the listener to have, or they think that people who listen to them are cool, as meeting people who give them the time of day is a rarity. I think in this case it could be a bit of both. Over on the next page, Jerry says that he hopes that they can one day become boyfriend and girlfriend. I don't know at this point if he's trying to manipulate her into feeling more comfortable with him, or if he genuinely wants to be in a relationship with a minor. If his words are taken on face value, and he does want to be in a relationship, this is delusion of the highest nature. What sort of relationship he is picturing the two could have together is beyond me. It's the most bizarre of thoughts. Further down the page, he even says that he could take a few hours off work and come meet her. Quote, I don't know where we could go. I would want to go somewhere that no one would see us together so people wouldn't wonder. What is it that people would wonder about, Jerry? If people would wonder about this situation, doesn't that mean you are doing something terribly wrong? At this point, he is actively choosing to engage with a truly dark part of his mind. Romance is important to Jerry. And over the rest of this page, we see that fact in full effect. He discloses that he would like to take her to a motel so that they can hang out away from other people. He muses over the thought that she would be a great kisser, and he also promises not to get her pregnant. We are dealing with a true gentleman here. The next page or so is just your general predator chatter. They begin to discuss time and dates for meeting up, which really excites Jerry. He accentuates again that they will be boyfriend and girlfriend if everything is to work out. He also agrees to bring the minor alcohol, and we get a glimpse into his controlling and paranoid side a little more. He tells the decoy she is not allowed to have any friends around while he is there. He says, I just want me and you, and I want it to be romantic. This little line shines a light on what Jerry really is at this point in his life. He is looking for someone that he can control, someone that he can order around, someone who will do what he says, and then he tries to disguise this controlling behavior under the blanket of romance. He says, You can't tell anyone, not even a best friend. We can't trust no one. The decoy says okay, and he responds with, You have the prettiest eyes. It makes my skin crawl how he says, we can't trust anyone. He's trying to make the child feel like she is bound to him. Saying the word we ensures that she feels like something is at stake for her as well, should anyone find out. He's a manipulator and is doing his best to wrap her up into his way of thinking, polluting her mind with his paranoia. Confusion is one of the key elements to manipulative control. Had he been talking to a real child here, there is a chance that she would be confused by his deep need for secrecy, and not wanting to let a friend down could have allowed herself to get wrapped up into his psychological game. He hasn't explained to her the need for secrecy. He hasn't explained to her at all why society doesn't want this relationship to take place. He is just letting her know that there is something wrong. But he is the good guy in it all. It is them and their beautiful relationship against the world. He's trying to get under her skin and force her to want what he wants without giving her the full details of the scenario. He then follows this discourse up with a compliment. You have the prettiest eyes. Another tactic often seen in emotionally abusive situations. Confuse and disrupt the target from what they know as reality and then follow it up with a compliment to solidify their connection to you. We're beginning to get a really clear picture here of why Jerry's marriage broke down. We're around halfway through the chat log and here it is. The moment that has defined Jerry's online infamy. The apple pie. 
Leading into the pie incident, Jerry asks the decoy if she likes romance. I find this question to be rather obtuse. Everyone likes romance, right? It's just that what one classes as romance may differ from individual to individual. Personally, I'd find it romantic to jump out of a plane with someone and getting a glimpse of each other as we plummet towards the ground, bonding over the moment long after we've parachuted to safety. I also think it quite romantic to go to a skate park, laughing and poking fun as we both fall and graze our knees. Although this is romantic to me, and possibly others, it would be insanely off-putting to some, who would view this as childish, unintellectual, and maybe even terrifying. What I'm trying to say is that romance is highly subjective, as everyone gravitates towards their own brand of romance. So Jerry clarifies that the child likes romance, and then states that he will be the best boyfriend for her. The savvy decoy asks if Jerry will bring her a present, to which Jerry replies, I don't know you that well to know what you like. So he doesn't know her well enough to know what gift to bring, but planning a future together where they are dating is not an issue at all. Jerry asks the decoy if she has any ideas for the gift. And here we have it. I like pie. If only Jerry were to know that those three words would be burned into the record books of the human race. He is now to be known as the apple pie predator for as long as the human civilization chooses to document these things. At some point in all of our lives, I think each of us wonders if we will make a difference to the world in some way, shape or form. I don't think though, that one could ever predict that this would be the mark that they are to leave on the world. The next page or so is an onslaught of questions. Is your hair long or short? Is it straight or curly? Are you getting something to eat? What kind of stuff do you eat? Where are your parents flying to? Do you have siblings? How old is your brother? Where is your brother? How do you dress? Do you wear dresses? How about a skirt? How will you dress tomorrow night? Do you like whipped cream with your pie? And the creme de la creme of them all. You want me, don't you? You want to make love to me, don't you? Near the end of page 7, we get a glimpse into the obsessive nature of his mind. He is becoming infatuated with the child, and this is noticeable as again he confirms that he will bring her alcohol. His words are, I'll get you whatever you like. All I want is you. All I can think about is being with you. This obsessive headspace is something that I would like to take a closer look at, and there's a great example of how it is playing out in his mind over on the next page. Something interesting happens here. The decoy asks Jerry a question. One of the rare moments in the log that a question is asked by the decoy. What do you do at work? Instead of taking the opportunity to try and spark a real conversation and build some sort of real connection with another human being, Jerry sinks back into his delusion. I'll explain what I mean. When a person becomes obsessed or infatuated with another, every little thought circles back to the focus of their obsession. Real communication is no longer possible as you are not dealing with an authentic version of that human. You are dealing with a machine that is constantly cycling through thoughts of their obsession. Every thought that processes through their mind has some link to the obsession. They will try to figure out ways to see that person, do things with that person, intertwine their lives with that person. They will change their values and morals to better align with those of the person they are obsessing over. They will become a robot that is programmed to find ways in which they can be close to the target of their obsession. This isn't isolated to predators either. This happens almost every day with people that you likely know. A person can become obsessed with almost anything, whether it be getting a promotion or winning a race. The list could go on and on. If it exists, you bet that a human can become obsessed with it. And right now in this chat log is an example of this happening. The decoy has asked what he does for work. And we will be taking his words on face value here, as I am certain they are lies. He explains to the decoy that he is a manager for the owner of the famous basketball team, the Lakers. Now he could have gone into detail about how he got this job, what his duties are, what he does and doesn't like about the work. They could have found some real common grounds here to possibly bond over. Instead though, his mind just finds another opportunity to circle back to the decoy, stating, maybe someday I can take you to a game. All he is thinking about is different ways that he can spend time with this person that he barely knows. He has a preset idea in his mind of what she is, of who she is, and he is obsessed with that idea, therefore he doesn't need to know anything more about her. There is no need for any sort of in-depth communication, as he already knows everything that he wants to know, 
and he is infatuated with that idea. He has no real interest in what she is interested in. What music does she like? How she likes to pass her time? He selectively talks about things that further perpetuate the idea in his mind of who she is. Surface layer things like her teeth looking good or her being a sweet girl. He is intent on being with someone who fits his idea of the perfect partner, a mindless, good-looking doll. He doesn't want to know about anything that could potentially break the idea of who she is in his mind. The sinister nature of this is that I believe he thinks that he is getting in while she is young. He probably assumes that because she is young, she hasn't developed a strong sense of self-identity yet. He thinks that he'll be able to train her to be his perfect partner, that he can get to her before the world does and turns her into, using his own words, a man-hater. We also have another display of true romantic dialogue here. Well, I just want you to know I was married for 16 years, and since me and my wife have divorced, I haven't been with another girl. She is the only girl I have ever been with, so you don't have to worry about catching anything from me. I am clean, disease-free. For such a romance fan, he really butchers those smooth lines. At this point, the conversation begins to turn very explicit and sexual. Here is the excerpt. Please take note of the decoy's responses. So, do you have any fantasies? Hmm, no. Really, you don't ever think about what it would be like to be with a guy? And if so, what you would like? No. Okay, have you ever seen, like, a dirty movie where they are having sex? No. So, you have no idea what to do then? No, you have to show me. That's okay, I can teach you. Don't worry about it. Really, most of it comes pretty natural. Okay. Let me ask this, and if you don't want to answer, it's okay. Okay. Have you ever masturbated and made yourself come? No. Okay. Then when we have sex, it will be totally new to you. It's okay. I will tell you about it when you want me to. Okay. The biggest thing is don't sweat it. It doesn't hurt as bad as some girls say. Okay. Cool. The trick is to just relax. Don't fight it going in. And since I will be gentle, it won't hurt. I'll use lubricant. Okay. It will just feel funny. It might feel like it's gonna hurt, and it may hurt a little. But once it's in, it will be fine. Okay. I'll just go slow, and hold you, and kiss you, and it will be fine. You know you should try masturbating. It will let you know how it feels, and it won't do anything to your virginity. Just make sure your hands are clean before you do. Hmm. Okay. If you wanted to, I could tell you what to do when we talk on the phone. Unless you're too shy for that. I've never been with a girl your age, so I don't know what to expect. Yeah. You are so beautiful and nice, and I really like you. I can't wait. It also appears at the end of that excerpt that the decoy taught Jerry some new text smileys. The decoy didn't ask for this conversation. We can see how sexually charged Jerry is. He really wants this situation to be real and is not paying any attention to the fact that she is giving really zero signs of interest to this part of the conversation, apart from an occasional cool. It's also important to note that we are nine pages in and there is still no sign of Adriana, the 22-year-old aunt that Jerry claims he was talking to. The rest of this page is general predator chatter. Jerry is getting more comfortable with the scenario, frequently referring to the decoy as sweetheart and honey. He also continues to brag about his lavish lifestyle, saying that he will be arriving in his new pimped out Cadillac. We're nearing the end of the chat now. And on the 10th page is one of the last bits of information that I have found interesting to pick apart. Quote, You know, I just want to tell you something. When we meet tomorrow, after we spend the night together and everything, if you decide you only want to just be friends, let me know, because I fall in love easily, especially if you are going to give your virginity to me. It will break my heart if I think you like me, then find out you don't. So just tell me if you do, okay? But if you really like me and we make love, tell me you love me, okay? When we make love, I will probably tell you I love you. Is that okay? Where do I even begin with this? He said earlier that he's only ever slept with his wife. Does this mean that during his marriage he was falling in love all over the place? How does he know that he falls in love so easily when he's only ever been with his wife? I'm not being naive here. 
I understand people can develop feelings for others whilst they are in a committed relationship, but to state that you fall in love easily seems a little manipulative, more like an attempt to make the girl take his feelings seriously in the hope that she develops some of her own. This man is so obsessed with the idea of sleeping with this young girl that he is beginning to show the cracks, allowing insecurities to marble sentences that shouldn't even be happening. I spoke earlier about obsessions and infatuation, and I'd like to touch on it here again. A lot of people can get love mixed up with infatuation, and if his words are taken on face value, ruling out the possibility of conscious manipulation, then I believe this is what we are witnessing here. Jerry has mistaken infatuation for love. He has likely not received much attention from the opposite sex in his life. I say this mostly because he's been married, but partly because he doesn't strike me as one with the highest amount of charm or charisma. He has found a person he is attracted to. The fact that she is a minor has been resolved within himself, and he is prepared to do whatever it takes to make the meeting occur. The decoy has filled a void that he doesn't know how to fill himself, and this has led to feelings which he interprets as love. Infatuated love is a dangerous brand of love to be playing with. If you think of love as a vase that holds beautiful flowers within it, then a healthy and loving relationship is one where both parties tend to the flowers through both good and difficult times. But infatuated love is someone who ignores the flowers inside the vase, obsessing over the beautiful qualities of the externals of it. They see something that is appealing to their eye and want to own it, without having any understanding of what is held within. This is what we are looking at with Jerry. He is ignoring the fact that there is no substance to this scenario. It's just an empty shell of something that he wishes he could have. He likes the look of her pictures. He likes that she is a virgin, that she hasn't had much experience with boys, with life in general for that matter. Her lack of life experience means that she might not figure out he is a loser, a poignant thought that he likely battles frequently. This shows as he brags, or lies, about his job, the car he drives, the apartment he owns. He is afraid of the reality of the emptiness that exists within himself. He likes the fact that she talks to him and indulges him when he goes on a sexually charged ramble. He's never had anything like this before. It's just a perfect storm. I'm unsure if Jerry was attracted to minors before this, but he sure as hell is attracted to one right now. He is feeling this false love and is so very desperate for her to feel it also. At the end of this page, it's amusing to see the decoy having a bit of fun with the pie comments, asking Jerry to bring all kinds of pies. And as a side note here, I'm unsure if Jerry is trying to be dirty with this comment or is just completely oblivious to the ironic nature of it. Do you like banana cream pie? I'll give him the benefit of the doubt on this one and say he's just oblivious. The final pages of chat log have nothing notable to pull apart. They discuss foods, logistics of the meetup confirming a time, date and location, and pleasantries are exchanged. Now, with all of that said and done, Jerry makes his way to the sting house. I know the clip has barely started, but I do have to stop it here. During the final stages of the chat log, there's a bit of back and forth about how he will actually enter the house. So entering the house is clearly a hurdle for Jerry, a mental gate that he must cross to make this night happen. If one single look could summarize the fear that many of the predators probably face by entering the house, this would be it. <coughs> Notice during the last few things that Jerry has said, he is using a slightly higher tone of voice, all while speaking in a gentle manner. He also rolls the pitch of his words from low to high as he finishes what he is saying. Okay, okay. What's that? Invite an apple pie. Sweet cream. Huh? Yep. Many studies have been conducted with varying results about the effects and usage of pitch and tone surrounding human communication. A common thread amongst these studies shows that people who use a higher tone and who bend their pitch upwards want to be viewed as non-threatening. 
We can assume in this moment that Jerry is aware of his status as an older male entering a house with a younger, unknown female. He wants to appear as a low-level danger as possible and is doing everything he can to facilitate this, being very agreeable and using a gentle but high tone of voice. So we have quite the... Uh... Shopping bag full of stuff there, huh? How's it going? This would have to be one of my favorite Hanson entrances of all time. The mixture of jolly tones in Hanson's voice with the ominous slow movement that he commands as he enters the room is absolutely brilliant. I know Hanson always has the upper hand being in the position that he is in, but in this specific instance, he really went all out to assert his dominance. So we have quite the... Uh... Shopping bag full of stuff there, huh? How's it going? Good. Much of a seat by the stool there. Okay. What's uh, what's happening? A whole lot. What are you here for? Uh, I don't know. You don't know? No. So you just decided to pop in the house because it looked like a nice house? No. I had some lady that told me she liked for me to call her. A lady? Yeah. Jerry's mind would be a confused mess right now. A barnyard that has just been hit by an earthquake full of runaway animals who are all struggling to find safety. Keep in mind that at this point in time, To Catch a Predator and Chris Hansen were not household names yet. Most men caught in this specific sting operation would have had no idea what they just walked into, not even an inkling. Chris is most likely assumed to be the girl's father at this point. Whilst Jerry is trying to figure out what is going on and formulating lies and reasons for why he is in the house, we see him amusingly state the age of the person when prompted for her name. And what was her name? She was 22 and I, I don't remember what her name was. 22. She said her name was 22. No, she said she was 22. She said her name was 22? No, she said she was 22. She said she was 22. Yeah. And she said that where? Over the internet? Yeah. Now what did you bring here? Why don't you show me what's in there? I brought an apple pie. Well, let me see. It seems as though Jerry is on autopilot at this point following Chris's commands with that question as his mind continues to race back and forth. We'll see him continue to try explain what he's doing here, even though he wasn't prompted to do so, as he unpacks the contents of the shopping bag. Well, that's fine. Yeah, she said that uh, she was 22. Her name was Adriana. Adriana? Huh? Yeah. What else did you bring? I brought some phones. So you've got whipped cream, apple pie, Heineken, a beer. Heineken almost had some product placement advertising right there. If Chris had only turned that bottle a little bit more. Not sure if that's the sort of advertising they want though. Some lubricant and some contraception. Yeah, she told me her name was Adriana and she was 22 and she asked me if I'd like to come on. 22? Yeah. I'd like to take a moment here to step back and look at what Jerry is really doing. Let's say for argument's sake that he is absolutely telling the truth and is there to meet 22 year old Adriana. If this were you and you had spent some time talking to a person of legal age, planned to meet up and then arrived on the night only to find a man in a business suit grilling you with questions, wouldn't you be upset, angered even? Jerry's entire demeanor is completely off for someone who is in the position that he claims to be in. If that were me, I'd be demanding answers from Chris right now. What is going on here? Who are you? Is this a prank? And I sure as hell would leave in a huff pretty quickly if those questions were not answered. Not Jerry though. He is acting like a guilty child who just got caught stealing from a store, explaining to the security guard that someone who works there said he could have it. And what's your name? My name is Jerry. Jerry? Jerry, what's your last name? Griffith. Griffith. And where do you live? I live in Long Beach. Long Beach. Mm -hmm. right. Now, you chatted for some time on the internet with this other person. Yeah. And so you know. This may seem like a silly reason to stop the video, but I have to point it out. Listen to the way Chris puts an inflection on the word no. And so you know. 
I would say the way Hansen talks is one of the main reasons this program picked up so much traction. His dialogue is so very unique and recognizable. The way he works the word no right now says more than I could say in paragraphs. He rolls the ending back and forth, which gives the impression that there is no escaping the truth. He says it this way to say, I've caught you red-handed, Jerry. It's pointless to try run and hide. It's futile to lie. The truth is clear and you have nowhere to go. He says all of that and more with that one small roll on the word no. And so you know that she's not 22 based upon what you told me. No, she told me she was 22. See, it started out, I was talking to some other person and then the other person quit talking to me and then one night when I was on the internet, she started chatting with me and she said she was this person's aunt. And I said, okay. And so I started talking to her. And she just thought I was nice. I thought she was nice. So she asked me to call her. Come over here? Yeah. And how did you get the address for this She gave it to me. This woman named? Adriana. Adriana. Hmm. And what about Amy? I think, I don't, I think Amy's her niece or something. Yeah. Adriana's supposed to be the aunt. Green Day chick. That's Amy. That's supposed to be, well... She told me that's her aunt's screen name. Really? Yeah. Now, you know, I have the transcript of the entire conversation. That's fine. But I thought I was talking to Adriana. Cool. Do you like older guys? I'm 35. Well, I'm 13. Oh my God. Laugh out loud. I'm sorry. I thought you were older. Time to pause for a bit. A lot happened just then. But I did want to let it play out without interruption so that we could witness the flow of that entire moment. I'll rewind it now and break each piece down as it unfolds. Hmm. And what about Amy? Chris confronts Jerry with some information that one could only know if reading the chat log. He asks about Amy, the name of the decoy. Watch as Jerry begins to process this new recognition that Chris may be more than what he appears. He looks into the distance for a moment, and with split-second timing, yet making a vocal stutter in the process, continues on with the lie. I think, I don't, I think Amy's her niece or something. Yeah. Adriana's supposed to be the aunt. Green Day chick. That's Amy. Hansen now digs his heels in a little harder, reading the screen name for the decoy, thus further confirming that he has in fact read the chat log. We can see the reality begin to sink in through Jerry's eyes. He again looks away to reassess the situation. This time though, not getting away as unscathed as before. The stumble over his words indicates this, as the gravity of the situation weighs heavier and heavier, the noose is tightening around his neck and he can feel it. Yet after all of that, his mind has done processing current information and the lie is deemed still possible. The show goes on as he continues with the lie. That's supposed to be, well, she told me that's her aunt's screen name. Really? Yeah. Now, you know, I have the transcript of the entire conversation. That's fine. I thought I was talking to Adriana. Jerry will not budge, and in a show of brute force, Hansen begins to read lines from the chat log. It's rather painful to watch. In the face of such overwhelming evidence, he continues to lie. Cool, do you like older guys? I'm 35. Well, I'm 13. Oh my God, laugh out loud. I'm sorry, I thought you were older. That was, I'm that was sure you don't want a guy my age laugh out loud. Right. Or cute. No, I don't know. That's when I first talked to the, the niece, and then I talked to the aunt after that. If you don't want to say it's okay. She said she, the lady I talked to said it was her aunt. If you don't want to say it's okay, but I know since you're only 13, are you experienced? Are you experienced with boys? I hope we become girlfriend. I hope we become boyfriend and girlfriend. Chris almost made a little error there, saying girlfriend when he was meant to say boyfriend. He had to go back and make sure that he read it the right way around. He needed to make sure that Jerry knows that he is reading exactly what's on the transcript. Nothing is being made up here. But I know with how young you are, you can't go on with. I, I don't yeah, know. we have to sneak, yes. Well, then I don't, don't know. Either. Bother you? No. Cool. Right. You don't care I'm 13? Do you care I'm 35? I don't know who she was talking to. No. What's your uh, screen name? Jerry Griffith. No. 
your screen name. So now, you need, to, yeah. you need to think about your answer here because we've done a lot of yeah. research. So I know a lot of things you probably don't think I know. That's fine. So it might be a good idea I, to tell the truth. I just thought I was talking to her aunt. I, I, How I, could you say that? Because she told me her name was Adriana. What's your screen name? My screen name is um, Brian B. Jones. How about Mr. B. Jones, too? Right, that's it. That's it. So your memory is a little better now? Well, no, that's, I mean, you just had me rattled. But... Jerry says, you just had me rattled, in reference to why he was unable to answer a simple question easily. This is one of the small windows into truthfulness that we see out of Jerry throughout the entire interview. I'm certain that Chris did have him rattled. In the last 30 seconds, Chris decided to take a more aggressive approach to the interview, to the point where it resembled a schoolboy getting into trouble from the principal. Hansen has rattled him and disrupted his flow. I doubt anyone in Jerry's life, other than his ex-wife maybe, has dealt with his lies like this before, and it's obvious he has no clue how to handle real confrontational conversations. No, I, I, she has an aunt named Adriana. She's 22 years old. I see none of that in this transcript. Well, that I, don't, I, I don't know how that's possible, but I talked to a girl named Adriana. Well, here you're talking to Green Day Check who has told you she's 13. You had a long conversation about the fact that she's 13. You asked her if it's going to be a problem. And furthermore, you talk about how she should make sure that there are no friends around, that there are no relatives who can drop in, to make sure that parents are gone. It's all right here. I don't want to tell you. How about the truth? I'm telling you, I came here for Adriana. She's 22. Can you see why I'm skeptical about that? I don't know what to tell Jerry is not giving an inch. He has firmly planted his feet where he stands and is not going to deviate from the path, no matter how feeble that path may be. In this break of silence, I imagine Chris is considering whether to keep chipping away at the stubborn liar or to pack it up and bring out the camera crew. Just like the bloodhound he is, he continues to read the chat log. Do you think you will ever want to do it with me? I promise to be gentle. I promise not to get you pregnant, too. Pay close attention to the eyes as they widen when Hansen reads, I promise not to get you pregnant. I promise not to get you pregnant, too. It's little moments like these that speak more than any words could. To a degree, a liar needs to believe their own lies to be able to put on a convincing performance. It's not uncommon to see a person whose business is failing, telling the people around them that everything is just fine, they will need to believe to a degree that everything is fine, because if they didn't, they would crumble under the buckling weight of the situation. Despite all of the evidence in front of them telling them that their business is finished, they will continue to convince themselves that it's not so bad. It's recoverable. One can also witness people lie about other things, like a man who has never run a race in his life, but is telling a woman whom he is trying to impress that he will try out for the Olympics next year, he will need to believe on some level this lie so that he can get into character of what an Olympic athlete may act like. What sort of confidence may they have? What would their demeanor be like? Lying is truly an art form when looked at from a certain point of view. It's essentially method acting when it's boiled down to the core, and it looks as though Jerry has fully gotten into character here, doing his best to convince himself that he is there to see Adriana. Every so often though, Chris will read a piece of the chat log that hits Jerry hard, reminding him of exactly who he is and what he is doing there. The eyes widening show that recognition right here. I promise not to get you pregnant too. You talk about going to a motel. You talk about your home. Well, whoever that girl was I was talking to, then I guess basically she must have been trapped me. Entrapment? Yeah. Really? And yeah, how she, was this she was leading me on. Who was leading on? Whoever it was I was talking to. I'll bring I don't some know birth... who I was talking to now. I'll bring some birth control gel, just in case. Condoms? Yeah, okay. Did you bring condoms? No. No condoms? No. Even though you said you would here. No. But you brought the gel. I was talking to... I thought I was talking to Adriana. Okay, do you want me to spend the night? Sure. Maybe you can bring some beer. You want me to? Yeah, that would be rocking. Cool, but you can't have any friends over. That would be too risky. I just want me and you, and I want it to be romantic. And you can't tell anyone, not even a best friend. 
We can't trust no one. She talks about bringing a pie, and here's a pie. Uh, I don't know if that is. I was talking to Adriana. What's your full name? Jerry Griffin. Jerry Griffin. Yeah. Jerry Eugene Griffin. And how old are you? I'm 45. 45. Yeah. Yet here you say you were 35. I, I thought I was talking to Adriana. But what does that have to do with whether or not you're telling the truth? There was no record of any Adriana. Well, I don't know how she did that. I don't know how she did that. Adriana was supposed to be her aunt. Adriana was supposed to be her aunt. Why should I believe that? She told me, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. She told me, when, when I first talked, talked to her, she told me that she had to leave town. And, that, and one night, Adriana started talking to me and said that she was her aunt. And she was 22 years old. Yeah, but none of that's in the transcript here. I, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you. The truth would be a good start. Well, I don't know what to tell you. You see how this looks? I don't know how it looks. It looks like you came here to visit a 13-year-old girl, and you were going to have sex with her. Or at least that's what you wanted to do. No, I thought it was going to be Adriana. Sure. That's what I thought. Come on. I thought it was going to be your aunt. Then why all the talk about keeping it secret and everything, if it was supposed to be... That was, that was her. No, oh, it's you, too. We it's, can't tell anyone. I thought I thought I was talking to Adrienne. She told me she was pointing to. Then why is it not reflected in the chat? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I got my screen names mixed up. I don't know. Maybe I thought I was talking to one person when I was really talking to another and I didn't. I mixed them up. I don't know. This is really quite something to behold. Jerry has no foundation for his defense, consisting of he believed he was talking to Adriana and I don't know what to tell you. This really must be how he handles situations in his life as the nonchalant manner in which he delivers these lines, in the face of the absolute magnitude of the situation, is really quite the spectacle. In a similar fashion to what we saw in the chat log, he hasn't taken any time to get to know who Chris is, just like he didn't take any time to get to know who Green Day Chick was. He has just made up something in his mind of what he is going to do, and that's the way it is. He hasn't asked if Chris was Green Day Chick, if Chris is law enforcement, or maybe a father, an uncle, a brother. Any one of these questions, had Hanson answered them, would have allowed him to see that his defense is next to useless. Like a child with cookie crumbs all over their mouth saying that they didn't eat the cookies. It was their brother. I don't know what to tell ya. Maybe I got my jars mixed up. I thought I was getting the jar full of walnuts. His stubbornness has likely gotten him through his entire life, as people would just give up with him after a while. It's really a marvel to watch when it's up against a force like Hansen, truly a battle of the stubborn titans. Why even take the chance then? Because I was, I was just going on a date. I thought maybe I could come over and meet her and she'd be a nice girl and she'd be, you know, she'd be single and, and we could date. But I didn't know it was, it was this girl. As Jerry is formulating lies, he has trouble maintaining eye contact. Something that Chris is very aware of. You're having a hard time looking me in the eye. I'll you look in the eye. Okay, I'll okay. look in the eye and tell you that. You're telling me Adrian. that you didn't know there was a 13 year old girl here. I thought it was Adrienne. You just looked away from me. Um, let me turn the chair. I'm sorry. I thought it was Adrienne. I thought she was 22. It was supposed to be an aunt or something like that. Eye contact is a very difficult thing to do for a lot of people, and not being able to maintain eye contact doesn't make you a liar. Each individual handles eye contact differently. Some people love to stare right down into your soul when communicating to get that deep sense of connection, whereas others like to float their attention towards the distance as they explore their thoughts with another. A more submissive person who is confronted by a dominant force may have trouble maintaining eye contact due to the intense nature of the interaction, even if the more submissive person is in the right. Humans are complicated and trying to interpret a generalized set of standards for eye contact, much like trying to read body language in vocal cues, will never yield perfect results. With all of that said though, let's try to interpret this situation a little. Jerry doesn't come across as overly dominant or submissive. 
He also seems very casual and laid back, more laid back than one would expect under the circumstances. He speaks with a degree of confidence and holds himself reasonably well for the amount of pressure he is currently under. If his story was real, I would expect him to look at Chris and maintain eye contact as he claims he is there to meet the 22-year-old Adriana. The lack of eye contact here is definitely representative of lies. But the problem, yeah. the problem is that I have all the transcripts here. I don't know. And there's no indication of that whatsoever. I don't what know. am I to believe? I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. I, well, I know it looks bad. I know it does. I'm just telling you. What am I supposed to do about it? I don't know. What do you think I would do about it? I don't know. I really don't know. If, if I had answers for you, I would tell you. But you see why this does not look good. I know it doesn't look good. I know it doesn't look good. Because Adrian is obviously not here. Obviously, this girl is 20, this girl is in 22. So, I don't know. Do you ever watch television? Once in a while. Do you ever watch Dateline NBC? Mm -hmm. I'm Chris Hansen. Okay. With Dateline NBC. We're Don't doing a story face. on computer pedagogy. Don't show my face. Now, if you have anything else you'd like to say about this situation, we'd like to hear it. If not, you're obviously free to go and take all your stuff. I've been speculating a lot on this video and making a lot of assumptions based on a few small minutes of this man's life that we have to work with. If this video is indicative of the life that he leads, I would say he does lie a lot to his friends, family, wife and colleagues. He's likely constructed a rather elaborate image of himself that he likes to paint to others. I could be wrong though. He may be very successful and is a shining example of how a person who is an active and high achiever can make a truly horrible decision. But I think not. I think that it was only a matter of time before all of those lies caught up to you, Jerry, and they caught up to you in the most explosive way possible. Don't show my face. You want to take your stuff? No, keep it. Yeah.